Hey there guys, Mr. Ridgway here. So I'm going to be making this video to begin to help you to understand how we analyze an argument. Uh, not only, in, I guess you could use this for history, um, but English or um, science, any kind of really non-fiction text. And as we begin to get into class here, uh, this skill analysis is really, really important. Uh, we're going to use it in... Um, really just a whole bunch of context and circumstances, but really for this video, I'm going to focus on how do you look at an argument um, much more beyond the, uh, really the idea that I found it and I'm done. Uh, so really understanding what an argument is trying to say, okay, looking at the component parts of it and how it kind of builds up to a foundation of, of actually saying something. Uh, and then from that point, um, kind of looking at also some of the bigger picture of um, some of the more I don't know, kind of like contextual things that an argument can contain. And you'll see what I mean by that here a little bit later. Um, so when I work with my students or work really with anybody on trying to help somebody find an argument, um, my, my question is to them is like, um, kind of like, what things are you looking for? Okay, so for example, and, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually pull up a text um, that we're using right now in class. Okay, and if you are a DCUSH student uh, looking for how you find this argument in this particular book, uh, you are more than welcome to go ahead and do so. Okay, um, and I'm just simply going to go to um, a book that we've been using in class, and um, we're going to take a look at that. Okay, uh, now, uh, so, like the first answer that I always get when it's like, how do you find an argument? And they're like, read. Uh, yes, re reading is going to be an essential part uh, to actually being able to find an argument, okay? Now, I just don't mean like reading as in like, yes, you need to be familiar with the text. Sure. Um, you also need to, like, when we read, you need to understand, like, a few kind of common things. Now, um, some people say, like, when I find an argument, it's, there's like a, um, you know, I look at the beginning or the end of a paragraph. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing uh, to start, you know, to start with. Um, some people will look for um, kind of very declarative sentences, so verbs like is, was, were, um, those kind of things where they're trying to state something is true. Um, other people will kind of look for a shift in tone um, from the author to kind of like find an author's thesis or really kind of like what they're looking for. Um, and other people will kind of like pay attention to subtitles. And so, for example, in this book, which is called Love and Hate in Jamestown, we have John Smith, Pocahontas, and the start of a new nation. So maybe then you're looking for something that's along those lines. Okay. And again, like, so like, what, what do you look for? Well, I'd say kind of a combination of all of those things. Alrighty. Uh, so when you're beginning to read a text and you're trying to find the argument, um, I would recommend that you begin to kind of understand what the purpose of um, kind of the book is. Uh, and what I, what I mean by that is like, so we have our prologue here in this book, okay? Um, and even as I begin to read this section, so we're going to start on this process of trying to find an argument. Um, what am I reading and why does the author have it in there is kind of like more or less the question. So as I start to read here, it says, in the year 1606 on a Roman tennis court, the artist Caravaggio killed an opponent after a uh, after an argument over a foul call. Now, immediately the question like goes off in my mind, what the heck does this have to do with John Smith, Pocahontas, and that kind of stuff? And as I keep going on, it talks about Galileo and um, the King James Bible. They're bringing proofs out. I'm like, okay, I know right now that I'm in an introduction. The guy's looking for some kind of attention-grabbing sentence. And as we go on here, then we start to see things that are more related to the actual text that we're looking for. So those three ships, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed and Discovery, went on to change the course of history. Um, after a series of fruitless attempts by the English to create an outpost in North America, the voyagers of 1606 finally broke through. Uh, the colony that they established at Jamestown would open the way for later English settlements up and down the East Coast and eventually for the United States itself. Okay, now this sentence is kind of important. Um, and w right here, okay, this is where I think some students kind of make a mistake. We, we hear that kind of shift in tone. But um, I think the tendency for a lot of students is that as soon as they see something that feels like they found the thesis or the argument, they're like, boom, done. Uh, no, like we want to actually understand and when we analyze an argument, we understand how he's coming up with those component parts, okay? And um, as you begin to then kind of read the rest of the chapter, uh, what we start to see here is that after this kind of introduction, okay, um, 
and we'll we'll talk about this uh, page five, the second page here in a second, is that he then kind of goes on to talk about um, who John Smith was. He gives a brief introduction of him, okay, and then um, we would assume then also a, an introduction of Pocahontas, but we'll kind of come back to that later because it is kind of missing, okay? So, how can we then, I guess the question is, begin to understand the component parts of an author's argument? So I'm going to go up here, okay, and there's another really important paragraph that if I were reading, I would notice kind of a shift in tone, okay? And it's right here on this on the second page, and it's, uh, so right here, he's, they're talking about why the, the colony's um, really, really struggling early on, okay, uh, that roughly, you know, uh, Many of them are dying because of uh, disease or, you know, um, lack of food. And it says, The survival of the small English outpost was thanks mostly to two extraordinary people, one a commoner and one a royal. The commoner was Captain John Smith, a former soldier with an impatient nature and a total lack of respect for his social betters or anyone else who hadn't proved himself through his merits. The royal was Pocahontas, the beautiful, headstrong daughter of the most powerful chief in Virginia. And for me, like, those two... Um, so this paragraph right here, this one right here, and then up here where it talks about um, that it would open up, you know, settlement um, all up and down the coast, and then eventually the United States itself. I have finally begun to see that this author's kind of John Smith, Pocahontas, and the start of a new, na new nation, those three things are now kind of starting to form a foundation of a person's argument, okay? So what I'm going to do here is if I were, for example... Okay. Um, one of the things that my students have to do is that when they get a text, and I'm just going to duplicate this tab here, um, is that they have to do what's called an argument analysis. And um, if you are a student watching this right now and wondering how to do one of those, um, I'm going to open it up and show you how, uh, how I do so. Okay. So argument analysis assignment. Okay, and then view. Uh, so, it says right here, uh, what is the book arguing or claiming is true? Quote it if you can with the page number or paraphrase it, two to three sentences. A good answer should try to find the argument and then explain its component parts, how the argument works. So, if I were to quote something, okay, I would say David Price's, back, forgot my space there, David Price's argument is that the survival of the colony is due to two people, John Smith and Pocahontas. Okay, and then I could just put in like a little parentheses five there. Okay, uh, now, uh, have we fully understood the argument though? No, not really, because the question that for me, and this is what I would, I, I want to push you as a student to, um, or push my students to get to, is that if we take this as true, that the survival of the colony is due to these two people, my, net, my next natural question should be, why? Or what about these two people caused it to survive? Okay? Now, obviously, uh, we could add in here, you know, the, the survival of this colony would eventually result in the successful founding of the United States. Okay, so that, that was kind of those two paragraphs roughly sum, summed up there. Okay, and, but again, we're still left with this question. How does John Smith and Pocahontas actually do this? Or what about them uh, does this? Okay, and again, like this, like knowing to ask that question comes with a lot of practice. Okay, and then over here, I've kind of got this little um, helpful guide that I've used with my classes. Uh, identify what their central claim is, thesis. And then what I'm really doing right now is identifying the structure of their argument and evaluating their sources and reasoning. So again, like if you want to buy David Price's argument, what do I have to see in order to actually understand that? So I'm going to go back to the text and I'm going to look for something about John Smith that proves that like why he was the one that was able to save the colony. And as I kind of scroll down here, there was something else that I saw, and I highlighted this in the text that kind of just jumped out to me because um, we're talking about, again, John Smith and the, and the starting of this new nation, and, and it was this. Those years also shaped his distinctive worldview, one in which ignorance was to be treated as a dangerous enemy and which people were to be judged by their effectiveness rather than by their bloodlines. 
okay? And if you're not familiar with the Jamestown story, John Smith is very famously the one who says that, like, if you don't work, you don't eat, okay? Uh, so once they take charge. And so then I'm kind of like wondering, I'm just kind of thinking about this, like, we should, people are more valuable for what they can do than who they are. And I asked my classes, so we're talking about the United States here, what is the American dream? And a lot of my students said something along the lines of, um, it's the idea that you come here no matter who you are and you can make something of yourself. And finally, the pieces started to kind of connect for them. So if we know that little bit of background knowledge about you know, the idea of America or the American dream, and John Smith is this person who says that you are here to basically, I, I value you because of what you can do and not because of who you are, how rich you are, those kind of things, we can start to see that something is happening with the character of John Smith for this author. Okay, and this is what I told my classes to write in response to that question. Um, for Price, John Smith saves the colony by, by being a prototypical American that what mattered was what a person could contribute, an early kind of, uh, an early kind of, an early kind of the American, early, maybe an early version of the American dream. Okay, so now we have the author's, um, we have that author's argument, or at least kind of like what he's leaning towards as to how John Smith saves the colony. He saves the colony by this kind of attitude that it matters what you can do, not who you are. And again, tying that into then what we know about today in America, there's definitely that ethic of like, you know, it, it's, it's about what you contribute, not about kind of like where you've been in life. Okay. Um, now from here, I asked the students, so like if we look back at the subtitle, and again, this is now starting to kind of like looking at step number four down here, evaluated as a whole, what are the limitations of their thesis or their writing? And I, and I asked the students, so like, okay, we have this introduction to John Smith in this chapter, but who's missing? And really it's Pocahontas. We don't, we, he says in here that it's, it's due to Pocahontas, but we don't see that in his um, introduction or his thesis. And, and what, I, what I said to them was, okay, so this is kind of missing, right? Like, this is what I, I like, logically, I want to know, like, this is a hole in his argument. And, and if I were doing this, um, I'm just going to make a note here, not sure how Pocahontas helped. Okay, just for now, because I, I don't see that in his introduction. And, and for me, like, as a, kind of as a thinker and somebody who's trying to understand this argument, that's kind of troubling for me. Okay. Uh, now, the rest of this argument analysis, like kind of like what, what are we looking for? Well, this is kind of what I was going back to saying in the introduction that we're trying to understand also the context of this author's argument. Like, why is he going out and saying this in this book? Why should we care? Uh, th these kind of things. So um, we're going to kind of look at a, some other related questions that can kind of help us get to this. So what kind of source materials is the author going to use? Um, does he use anything that a normal historian wouldn't use or a, even like in a, let's say it was a nonfiction non English text, where there'd be something that like, uh, you know, that we're not expecting to see in there. And really, uh, lots of students in here talked about um, that there was a, a brief song mentioned. We have these maps in here. So I would say something like, um, normal sources used um, except for a song mentioned earlier because um, again like maps or that would be kind of a normal primary source that we would expect to see um, in a historian's book now this is again where we're kind of like going down and we're thinking about the rest of what the author's saying um, does the author acknowledge any other person's works if so do they accept or reject these secondary sources um, and in this section and obviously, if we're talking about Pocahontas and John Smith in this example, um, there's one thing you cannot avoid, and that is talking about the Disney movie that came out, I think it was in 95. Yes, it's right here. Yeah, so, um, and, you, uh, and he very rightly um, 
for David Price mentions that that movie is full of problems uh, from the point of a historical record. So he definitely, I would say, acknowledges the Disney movie from 1995, um, seems to reject most of its conclusions. Okay. Now, if he had, for example, gone on and mentioned other historians who tried to deal with John Smith or other scholars, and maybe let's say he says, I'm building off of this work that this author said before, we would want to mention that here. Okay, Because again, no writer ever writes in a vacuum. They're always acknowledging something that's come before or kind of like using the same methodology um, that another person has, those kinds of things. Uh, summary of content. Here, um, I'm really asking my students and I'm asking you, um, what, uh, what, what's the book about? Like, what, if, if you had to give me a 30-second elevator speech, um, what's it about? Well, obviously, the subtitle is going to be a huge help here. John Smith, Pocahontas, and the start of a new nation. Now, do not, though, put the subtitle as your answer. The subtitle can be a great place to start, but it's really probably not going to tell us what this is. If we think about, like, this book, Love and Hate in Jamestown, it's probably going to be makes, so makes me think, this book is going to be a history of the colony of Jamestown. And that's probably like what I'd say. Um, because again, like John Smith Pocahontas and the start of a na new nation doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it's, it's really like the book is about the history of Jamestown, but it will probably focus on those two characters, right? Um, and we could even put this in quotes just to make sure that we acknowledge that that's a subtitle. Okay, the big thing, again, the point here is that just don't use the subtitle uh, as, as your answer for what the, con like, what the book's going to be about. It's, it's probably going to be a little bit more in-depth than that. Uh, so now, uh, is it an analysis or a narrative? It is definitely a narrative. A narrative is a story. Okay, it's going to give us like a, an actual arc. Um, you know, uh, of any kind of non, or even, well, even really fit any fictional or non-fictional story. Um, and an analysis are very, very different. Um, yeah, boring would be one word, I guess, for them. Um, but analysis, is, they're going to take you through um, an argument. Okay, a narrative can still have an argument. That's something that uh, a lot of students kind of make the mistake of. Um, but analysis is simply just going to be an argument with no story, if that kind of um, makes sense. Okay, and then I want my students to kind of think about the book. Um, what kind of things is it going to focus on? Um, and it's going to talk about Native Americans, so definitely race. Uh, class, obviously with John Smith not liking people who think that they're better than other people, uh, we're going to be talking about class. And gender, i um, going to be talking about Pocahontas, so probably gender is going to be somewhere in there. Uh, nationalistic. Does, is the book talking about the formation of nations or identities? Um, and the subtitle, absolutely yes in this case. Okay, and that's, and that's how we get that one. Focuses on national ideas or institutions, Congress, freedom, or justice. And not so much. This isn't what we call a consensus history. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Pro-capitalism, no. Makes, tries to make people feel like they were in the history themselves, no. I, I, don't, I don't get the sense from reading this text that I can see the Susan Constant as it, you know, as the waves hit its side and it rode up onto the shore. It's, it's not what we call a romantic uh, history. Uh, now, is the book intended for scholar or uh, scholarly or a popular audience? Um, there's a few ways that we can kind of tell this, and I and I encourage my students to think about audience really, really carefully because it can help us understand why the work is being written. This is John Smith and Pocahontas, probably one of the better known two figures, at least in U.S. history, um, at least popularly, and that should tell us that this is going to be a history written for anybody who picks up this book. It's a popular book. Okay, now, if it were for scholars, we would definitely get a very, very different sense of the tone of this book. We would see a lot more talking about other people who've written about this subject. We'd see a lot more kind of like argumentation as the guy's trying to like, or girl who's writing is trying to um, kind of fit themselves into the literature. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that, that can kind of help us understand why a book is going to one audience or the other. Um, the thing also that I would encourage you to think about is who's the book written by? Okay, so like PhDs, um, if they have a degree, they're pr probably doing a scholarly work. Not always. They can, you know, PhDs are totally capable, and, and mo many of them uh, do write narratives instead of analyses. So that can be kind of something else that can kind of um, help you understand if it's popular or um, scholarly. 
Uh, and um, we also want to consider like the background of those particular um, people as well and kind of maybe the books they've written in the past. Those can kind of give you um, some ideas. Subject matter always, though, is, is a good way to look. And that kind of ends um, the argument analysis. There's a couple other things I want to leave you with here before I end this video in terms of how to analyze an argument. And this is kind of like more kind of just like broad thinking that I encourage my students to do. Um, and it's, it's kind of really just about every argument in general. And some of this we've talk, talked about. So like, what's the audience that the book is going for? We mentioned that. Uh, is there significance um, that we should, that, like the, that the author is trying to point out that we should understand? And in this book that we just kind of looked at, it's definitely this idea that this is where America gets not only its start, but then also kind of like its culture and ethic of, it doesn't matter who you are, it matters what you can do, okay? Um, we talked about the foundation of other research, we talked about evidence, and the last thing I really want to um, mention to you is that when you're looking at an argument, it's important to understand that historians also come in different types, okay? Um, and I have some examples here. New left historians, these are kind of the guys who were writing in the 1960s, 1970s, um, and even after, they emphasize themes of race, gender, and social class, Okay, uh, the, the new left trinity, it's called. Um, and then we'll get, like, it's kind of like Baskin Robbins, you get all these different flavors. Uh, consensus historians like to talk about ideas and national institutions. So these guys are writing after World War II, and they're talking really about, like, how coming, like, all these things that kind of unify us as Americans are the things that we should kind of pick apart in the past and, um, and understand kind of and appreciate those things. So um, Congress... Uh, the idea of um, kind of like these nationally binding institutions, whether those are physical or not. Uh, and then it says down there, the last one, romantic historians like to write as if you were there witnessing an event yourself. Um, and these ones, the romantic histories, are very, very interesting because we get this kind of like leap of imagination as the historian tries to make us feel as we were there. You know, you could feel the mosquitoes stinging you in the neck as you got to Jamestown. And you're like, you know, as you're feeling it, you can like feel all the bugs crawling over you. Okay. Romantic histories are pretty rare. We don't get them too often anymore um, just because... Uh, Obviously, when you have to kind of imagine those things, there's not a lot of source material that exists for those. Um, but as you can see, like just from these three examples, we get a lot of different types of historians who like to focus on lots of different things. Okay, uh, So hopefully this video, I know that was a little bit convoluted and I used a text to kind of help explain. Hopefully this video will be helpful for you in kind of seeing how we do break down an argument and we try to kind of like logically understand it piece by piece and then kind of how we evaluate it as a whole. Um, because there does come a time that after we look at an argument, we've really spent some time kind of thinking about it and um, understanding how the component parts work that we come to the point where it's like, okay, so do we buy this? Uh, should we accept this person's thought as true? And that's kind of uh, where I would like you to get in terms of actually being able to analyze an argument. Okay, so until next time, uh, keep reading, keep up the analysis, and uh, keep up the good work. Bye-bye.